2020, 5.30 p.m. The first item of business is the roll call. John DeLeo? Here. Okay. Mark Rich? Here. Rick Lyles? Here. David Burks? Here. Nelson Giel? Here. Have we have had the council approved new members yet? No, not yet, John. Okay. In that case, we're we're here. Uh, next item is adoption of the minutes from July first, twenty twenty. Does someone have a motion regarding the minutes, please? Move that they be so approved. Moved. Is there a second? But now who you got for the first, yes. Okay. <laughs> Any additions <laughs> or corrections to the minutes? Hearing none, all in favor, please raise a hand. Looks like we've adopted the minutes. Okay. Next item of business, preliminary plan for a major use site development and major subdivision entitled Kelly Estates for Stephen Grass. The proposal is to construct seven duplex buildings consisting of 14 units, a total of 17,024 square feet on a 12.8 acre property located off the Bangor Road Tax map 75, lots 16-1 and 17-1 in the rural and limited residential zones. Is someone representing the applicant, please? Yes, I'm representing uh, Kelly Way, LLC. Uh, my name is Jim Kaiser. Oh, Go ahead, please. Um, Don, may I my son say something just before we proceed? Sure. And just for disclosure purposes, uh, the applicant, Steve, is a neighbor of mine. He lives down the road. Uh, I mean, we're familiar with each other for a long period of time from both my prior employment and his being a manager at Walmart. But I don't feel that that's going to influence my decision one way or another. If if Steve is okay with me continuing, I will continue on. No objections? I don't have any issues with it at all. Okay, nor do I. Okay, Jim, please proceed. Yes, uh, we're developing a 12.8 acre parcel that's uh, on the Bangor Road across from Atlantic Landscape. Uh, <clears throat> that the project is to develop 14 uh, attached single family residential units in seven buildings uh, so that there'll be duplex units. Um, across the site. We're going to have one access at the location of the existing uh, access onto the property. Uh, that uh, access point has been uh, approved and upgraded for this development through uh, MDOT. Uh, they have a couple conditions on it, but uh, uh, we're fine with the conditions and they did grant a waiver uh, to reduce night distance slightly and uh, uh, because that's a um, retrograde arterial corridor, Route 3 being uh, Bangalore Road. The area <clears throat> um, slopes pretty much away from Bangalore Road down onto the site. Um, as you get back in behind where we're proposing development, uh, it does get wet mostly from slope uh, seepage, uh, but it has been mapped as wetlands. Uh, it drops down to a low area where there's a stream crossing, uh, comes up slightly and continues to the rear of the property and uh, which is about the location of where Gilpatrick stream or brook crosses the rear, very rear of the property. Uh, really accessibility is uh, what we have shown on the, pro on the plans to date. Uh, going further back is impeded by the wetlands and, and slope areas. The units are uh, going to be one bedroom rental units. Uh, they'll be served by on site sewer and on site uh, drilled wells. Uh, each well will, uh, we're proposing two wells to keep them below the public drinking water uh, criteria. 
So each well will serve um, up to uh, nine units. Uh, I think we have one serving um, four buildings and one serving three buildings. The uh, site is, uh, we're proposing to provide fire protection in accordance with the ordinance through underground uh, storage tanks, which will be uh, to the 10,000 gallon level for this development. They're located at the entrance to the uh, development uh, with a turnout uh, or access to a dry hydrant beside the turnout that will be uh, designed and, and installed in accordance with the uh, city's criteria. We do have a detail on a plan and that will be upgraded a little bit more based on some comments from the TRT meeting. <clears throat> We're providing a turnaround at the end. Uh, we propose that currently at uh, 50 feet uh, in depth. Uh, we recognize that the ordinance is uh, 70 feet. We can expand that out um, 10 feet, but then it puts us right on the property line and we don't have really any other uh, distance to get. However, we have provided some uh, turning uh, evaluations on that turnaround and it does uh, satisfy turning requirements uh, for the uh, fire protection equipment that uh, have been provided to us through uh, the city. So we think that uh, 50 feet, uh, excuse me, 60 feet by adding that additional 10 uh, should provide uh, plenty of accommodations for that. And we would request that the board grant us a waiver on that 10 foot uh, differential on that. Uh, we do have a dumpster located at the same place because it only makes sense to provide one turnaround area. Um, if that's not quite wide enough, as we talk to the department, uh, we can widen that uh, a little bit to give the equipment a little bit more width room to accommodate that turnaround. And we'll work closely with um, the department to accommodate their apparatus uh, for turning on that. There really isn't a good location to add the dumpster into another spot in the site and uh, to create another turnaround just uh, increases impervious area on the property, which uh, developments and uh, stormwater criteria are looking to minimize at this current time. So we think we can provide the turnaround that will be acceptable to the, the city at that same location, keeping the dumpster at that location. Uh, and I think that pretty much goes to a summary of what we're providing. We'd be more than happy to answer any questions that the board may have at this time. Okay, questions from the board. Yes. John, please. Okay, I'll start off. Um, Tim, in, in the application itself, uh, page two of five, under development information, uh, section 4J, the estimated cost of the proposed development or changes, it's listed as $125,000. Is that the estimated cost of the whole project? That's the cost of the road, the infrastructure cost, which is what we understood was uh, required on that. Full build out of all units would be uh, substantially more than that, obviously. Uh, perhaps somebody from the city isn't that where it's usually the estimated cost of the whole project is listed? Normally it is, yes. Uh, Dwight and Teresa, can you unmute yourselves, please? Yes, typically, uh, John, John Leo is right. Typically it's the cost of the whole project or as close to an estimate as, we, as you can get. We can upgrade that to include that, but we would, you know, each of the buildings is going to be obviously added significant costs on that. But those will be developed over time. So as uh, equity is built in the project that will be able to be included in uh, further financing of the package. Well, I'm not sure that is quite what we want. I just call for the total amount of the development. Uh, the fact that you're going to be spacing out the building of those does not is not really our concern. Our concern is to know the total cost of the project. 
Yeah, and we'll we'll bring that up, John, uh, for final approval. We'll okay. More than happy to supply that. Good, thank you. Yeah. Again, kind of along that, that same part uh, in section three of your application form, you have a letter from a Chaya Savings Bank uh, dealing with that they're going to fund the project, but they also reference that hundred twenty-five thousand. So I think we would have you would have to get an updated letter from Machaya Savings Bank uh, in reference to uh, Absolutely, John, one. yeah. Okay. Uh, a couple other questions. On, uh, I know it was on, on the site plan. Are you planning on putting a, a stop sign at the intersection with the Bangor Road? Uh, were you planning on putting a street light at that intersection? Uh, we weren't planning on it right now. Um, at this point in time, we're just using lighting as that would be concerned. We're going to have a CMP, um, or excuse me, Bangor Hydro uh, easement going down to service all the poles and power into the facility. So uh, we can locate one up there if if uh, if it's preferred. Uh, that would be on a lease agreement uh, with Bangor Hydro, Amera, or whatever they're Person. called now. Yeah, you know, so, I, mean, uh, I think for as many potential uh, dwellings as, as they're in there, I think it would be prudent to have a, a street light at that location. Yeah, we can do that. Like and I said, that would be a contract light with, with uh, Bangor Hydro. Right. I was, I was just kind of wondering, on the entrance itself, uh, there's a, a slight angle. I know Bangor, I mean, uh, DOT has looked at this, but is there any way to Fudge that a little, so would it actually be a right angle coming out onto the Bangor Road? Uh, uh, there's a, we kind of we kind of held the existing driveway going in there. There is kind of a an old driveway entering that property right at that location, so we held that angle uh, from that uh, existing work that had been done years ago, and kept it. And DOT didn't have a problem as you as you're aware of. Uh, on that, so uh, we haven't changed that angle. I think it complies with the minimum, maximum angle under the ordinance. Okay. Uh, and then on in your section seven, under the subservice wastewater disposal systems, uh, I'm just a little little confused because there's several pages there that uh, the first section, page two or three, it, it shows. Two 1,500 gallon septic tanks between buildings three and four and seven and eight, and then one below that. But then on another page, it shows two 1,500 gallon septic tanks between one and two and five and six. And then it's different on the site plan itself. It's like um, sheet one dash two. So I don't know if the, <clears throat> where you have a different number of septic tanks in the book itself makes any difference in what you're showing on the site plan? No, we're, we're basically, if you look at those, they're basically set up for each individual field. So um, the one system will cover uh, units on the other side of the road, which is a higher one that says system one on it. That would cover units three and four and seven and eight. And so that system is geared to uh, those particulars. So when you see the two septic tanks there, that's for um, that field, that line of uh, concrete chambers. And we do that for each one because they're independent items on it. Uh, so each one is just designed for the units that they're covering and the system that is serving those units. So well, that's why you see uh, kind of a little bit different on each one. Um, but each plan, uh, when the permit is issued, would be accommodated. So buildings one, two, units one, two, five, six, most likely are going to be the first ones constructed. And that system uh, will follow that particular HHE 200 form for install. Okay. Another question I have is on uh, the drilled well that is kind of in the north 
west corner, close to the property line. I, I note that it's oh, maybe within 30 feet of the neighbor's drilled well, where your that drilled well, I suspect, would serve could serve as many as eight units. Being as close to the neighbor's well, uh, is there any possibility that that's going to negatively impact the neighbor's well? Uh, we don't anticipate it that it will. Uh, we still will probably do a flow test on that just to confirm things, but uh, I'm not anticipating it. That well was located originally for the abutting property before that lot was divided. And when they divide it, they kind of missed the lot line and that well kind of got included on, on, the, on our property rather than on the neighbor's property. So they had to drill a new well and they just happened to drill that new well uh, on the same side close to that one so that they could utilize the uh, line going into the house, I assume. So um, the well that is on our property is an older well uh, and we do need to confirm that, but if not, we will be drilling another one in that same general area. Okay, if it's, <clears throat> I guess maybe this is more of a question for Dwight. If, if if you have to drill another well, would it be better? Would it be better to drill it further enough away from the property line that if the neighbor happens to put in a leach field well, right next to his your yeah. line, it won't affect your well. You can install a leach field within 100 feet of a well. So that's protected by state law. No, no site evaluator will do it. No well driller will do it. Now, there are certain yeah. variances you can get for existing systems, but you wouldn't be able to put a new leach field within 100 feet of that well. Which would include our well and their own well, John. Okay, I know you couldn't do it on your own property. I didn't realize that. You, yeah, you can do it on. We we actually had to take into account the well. It's on the uh, property to the south of us. Uh, that's shown on the plans also. So we had to account for that well when we located systems. I was just kind of curious. On um, there's there appears to be a maybe a, a surveyor stay oh, in the can, can neighbors. You, can we just go back to the well for a second before you go oh. off this? I, uh, I would just reiterate the need to have uh, some sort of calculations and so forth that show that these there's not a, a super negative interaction between these two wells or between the wells, which you said you're going to do. I just want to make sure that it, it's clear that it should be done. Uh, and so, some note to that effect should be in the final plan, final uh, approval packet. That's, it. Uh, that's typically not usually done on these types of projects to have a well drawdown test on it from that standpoint. Well, you have, you have a, a, you know, that crosses the property line and everything. It seems to me that, you know, the, the existing folks in the, you know, with the drill well would want to know whether or not they're going to be adversely affected. Yeah, just usually we don't have that request being presented on it from that standpoint. Um, this isn't a high use develop, you know, basically utilization on it. So, um, but if that's what the board prefers, then, then we'll see that it ad is addressed. Would the board prefer that? I'd like to see something uh, on the record that shows that it's okay. Yeah, personally. The rest of us? Yes. Okay. Yes. Right. Okay. Seems to be consensus, yes. I mean, I would have to gain approval from the abutter to basically test their well, monitor their well uh, from that standpoint, because uh, I can't test it without having both access, access to both wells. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you can't, you can't, so. We'll certainly check into that and uh, I can advise you at, at the. At the final? Yeah. Very good. And Jim, one final question. Uh, I'm just kind of curious. There seemed to be a, a surveyor's stake in the neighbor's kind of edge of his driveway. Is, is is that the boundary line? Yeah, that's our corner pin up on that. You're talking about on the uh, northwest corner? Yeah, I mean, it was kind of looked like it was more on 
the neighbor's property than because it was kind of like on the edge of the driveway. I, it is very close to the edge of the driveway on that, and that that is uh, a pin that was set by the surveyors. Yes. Okay. They did drive it down yeah. deep, but they have the witness stake beside it. Yeah. I was just wondering if the homeowner knew exactly where his property line was. They they actually understood that um, a while ago when they were investigating the well issues. Okay, thank you. I'm done, John. Thank you. Anyone else have a question? Uh, yeah, David, I've got to. I've got a couple here. Um, I'd like to echo John's concern about that entrance to the uh, to the project. Um, and I see that culverts aren't required. Is there any grade to the entrance of that going into the project? It, does it does it go down um, into the project and go, or does it, or is it is it level? The the road has a road shoulder on it, which is several feet in elevation difference uh, on it, and then our entire property slopes to the east um, from the roadway, so mm -hmm. that there's no ditch in the roadway, uh, and there's no culverts. And DOT has looked at it, and they didn't feel they needed a culvert either based on what we were proposing. Okay, that, that makes sense, but it's just, you know, because people go lickety split uh, down that, that road and around the corner and, uh, you know, and, and, you know, getting it to a 90 degree might, might alleviate any possible accidents that might hit there. Yeah, we have uh, actually have a uh, condition on the MDOT approval that we need to do some clearing uh, if you look at the existing vegetation right to the north side of that, they want that all cleared back out of the right away. So we'll be doing that. Right. I haven't shown it yet on the plan, but um, where I was showing a tree line on our property, that will actually all go away. All that vegetation will go away uh, from that standpoint. All right. Thank you, Jim. Uh, on that clearing um, for the visibility, Let's see, in section five, the, the waiver uh, email says the driveway does not currently meet the standard, but they're providing the waiver at 703 feet. Is that 703 feet after the clearing, or is it 703? Uh, 703 feet now. They estimate now. the clearing will get more. I do believe, anyhow, uh, I measured it out there, and it was in excess of, of um, 600. You can actually see the intersection of Red Bridge Road uh, when you're standing up on the uh, access point uh, following the site distance criteria. Uh, so I, I didn't actually measure it. I thought we had it uh, from that standpoint, but they said we had seven something. Uh, and actually I was looking at a little less because I didn't, I forgot that that was a retrograde arterial which increases the site distance on it. Um, so so I, I did want to follow up on both John and, and Dave there um, to, I think, really drive this idea home that th that stretch of road, that the, the 1A super speedway, uh, it's already very unsafe. It's accident prone. I'm frankly amazed that they would grant a waiver at 70% of w what's required for a few dis distance on that stretch. Um, I would frankly go the other way. I think additional prudence in, in, in that section would be would be wise. L looking at that stretch, um, just a concern that, that I have just looking at it, I, I can see a scenario where eastbound traffic pushes over the center line going around cars that are turning off to Red Bridge and westbound traffic pushes over the center line turning around cars that are turning into the in, in this new uh, development. And just in general, it's a bad stretch. And while I, un I understand, I hear that you're saying that that the plans are meeting the spec as they're written, but uh, this is not a usual stretch of road when it comes to safety. And I think additional prudence ap absolutely would be appreciated and, and, and probably reasonable in, in this context. Um, I don't know whether, you know, turn off lanes or developers, you know, scenario where that comes to the M MDOT, but um, just what half a mile up the road, it, whatever it is there, the top of the hill, uh, multiple accidents every year at, at that intersection. And this is, I understand, 100 trips a day, so it's not a tremendous number of trips, but really any addition to this stretch that's already proven um, fatal, you know, multiple fatalities a year, I think it's just something to keep in mind as we're, as we're adding to the, to the volume, in, in, you know, right here. So um, I don't know what could be done, um, but I would just suggest, yeah, 
you know, in, in good faith, like any additional safety engineering that could be built into yeah. the into the traffic situation be considered here. We can certainly relook at that. You got to also keep in mind, though, that uh, when DOT lists this as a retrograde arterial, uh, they pretty much double the sight distance requirements from the basic entrance onto the same speed limit roadway in uh, other areas, so that there is significantly more than um, what would be required in, in that speed limit zone uh, on another uh, state highway. Sure. Well, I, I think we all hope that they are taking into account the realities of the traffic situation on this stretch, which are pretty dire right now. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Anyone else have questions? A couple. Um, I would just ask uh, Mike, uh, Fire Mike, the Fireman Mike, we have, whatever. Anyway, that uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, you know, what the TRT uh, report said and what uh, uh, Mr. Kaiser said and so forth, are you okay with, uh, with the turnarounds as, as are being proposed? You good with that or? Okay, so I've had a chance to talk with Chief um, uh, while I was away, he kind of had a chance to look at it. Um, with the increase of from 50 to 60 feet, I think, I think he's good with that. Um, I don't see an issue with that. However, with the dumpster pad in the turnaround, um, we, and, and Jim actually alluded to it, we would be much in favor of widening, widening that turnaround um, to accommodate both um, the dumpster pad and, um, and, and a fire apparatus. So right now, you know, the dumpster pad is basically 10 by 12. Um, so that kind of reduces the width of that 24 um, foot wide down to either whatever, whether it's 12 one way or 10 the other way. So we, we actually proposing that the width of that be anywhere from 34 to 35 feet rather than the 24. Um, that would give us plenty of clearance and a buffer in the event that the dumpster um, either is not positioned properly or is it right at the edge of its pad or accidentally gets moved or whatever, um, that gives us a little bit more width uh, within that turnaround. Um, so we're good with the 60 feet. Uh, you have to grant the waiver. I cannot do that. No, I understand that. And we would like to see the width increased from 24 to either 34 or 35 feet. And yeah, we, Mr. Kaiser, would you be able to do that? that. Pardon we me? can accommodate that from that standpoint. Okay. Okay. The other so, thing, I guess, Mike, while we while we're talking about that here briefly, uh, is there? I put that on the uh, essentially a backup position where it'd be on the passenger side for the dumpster. Is that would you prefer it on that side or the other side? I will have to get back to you on that. Okay. I'll make a note until it was visible in the mirror as they started turning back rather yep. than blindsided on the driver's side. Okay. I'll get back to you on that, Jim. I'll send you an email. Okay. Thank you. I okay. do have a question, Jim. Yep. Why can't the um, turnaround be as the ordinance requires? I, I just don't have any room. Our buildings are pretty much on the property line, set back uh, on the north side of it. And so when we stretch that out, we just are having tough time tightening it up on it. By getting 10 feet, uh, I've got just a couple feet left to put in any kind of grading that I need to on that property line. Okay, well suppose the board did not grant the waiver, what would happen? Uh, we'd have to really that fight to scrape to figure out how we're gonna get that in there. Any further questions from the board? Yeah, one more about the uh, the traffic generation in section five, um, and I don't think that the uh, I don't think that this is not a question of the numbers being substantially changed or whatever. But um, you know, you're using a seventh generation of the ITE trip generation journal uh, generation manual, and it's currently up to in 2020. It's up to version 10, uh, so you might right. want to check that out. And again, it's not, not so much of a problem here, but going forward, uh, it may well be. And for example, what you have is 220, code 221, low rise apartment. Um, isn't, if it was then, it isn't now, okay? 221 is a multifamily mid range. 
Um, and it's really not a multifamily low range either. So, but again, under most, the way you would work with those numbers and so forth, I don't think they really have changed appreciably from what you've shown here, okay? But, but all the referencing really is, is not up to current standards. The reason why we use that, Rick, is because that's what still MDOT is utilizing. Uh, they, they will take some utilization in talking with traffic engineers out of the uh, more recent edition, which I understand does lower some of the traffic generation numbers anyhow. But right now, the official, from what my understanding is, uh, edition seven is still the one that's uh, officially accepted by uh, MDOT on their analysis. Well, well that, that's not very good on MDOT then because it should, uh, be, up to, it should be up to snuff. In fact, they're doing a, a, a revision 11 even as we speak. Yeah, I'm sure they are. I, I, and I can't speak for MDOT, so. Are there any further questions from the board? John? Yes. I, I have a couple questions I want to pose. It's Mark Rich. Um, would it be plausible to go from a T turnaround to a Y turnaround to get that 70 feet we require? Um, I just seem to look at this map and it seems to me like there might be 70 feet available if it was a Y. And then the other question I would say, would, be, would it be plausible to take the dumpster out of that turnaround and put it on a separate, uh, space right next to the turnaround? Uh, as far as the, and start with the Y turnaround, um, usually that's just more cumbersome on, on uh, turning a vehicle because it's a much sharper turn on one of the angles. Mm -hmm. uh, so that when the department moves in there uh, for, with a fire apparatus, if it's a Y turn, it's a much sharper turn to begin there backing up and, and accessing that Y. Uh, so usually a T is much more readily accessible and, and preferred by uh, most uh, uh, fire departments and also uh, public works departments when it's, when it's being proposed. Uh, so that's why we generally tend to use them. Uh, there is, you know, we could put the dumpster on a separate thing, but I think in the essence to save um, impervious surface and also accessibility in that area uh, if the if we can widen it and satisfy the department I think that would probably uh, serve everybody uh, best off overall uh, so we'd like to do it that way if and certainly uh, Mike indicated that they would be receptive to it and I think we can meet their their width requirements for that so, 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 Mark, I think the, the idea of the T-turn here is, if, if I can use the terminology, the, the backing approach angle into that T is a lot more accommodating than if he was to create a Y in there right now. Sure. Okay. Correct. Anyone else have questions? I, I have a comment, John. Yes? Teresa has a comment. Um, because they're single family attached units, the code says that they do not need a landscaping plan. And it's written in the T, RT report that the applicant could consider including a landscaping plan. And I was wondering if the planning board could comment on that. From my perspective, a landscaping plan is always a good idea. Others, I would point out that because of the way the ordinance is written, we can't actually require it. Other thoughts? Another reason for revisions to the ordinance, but hey, yes. that's another day. It's, well, how would you like to be a committee of one to do that? Uh, that needs to come out of the comprehensive, uh, the comprehensive plan redo. But uh, I'll be glad to be a committee of more than one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, this is a public hearing. Does anyone wish to comment upon this application? Nate and Dwight, do you have anyone? Uh, 
Uh, Carrie would be any uh, any the only one that would be seeing anything right now. I haven't seen anything come in uh, via the uh, um, webinar itself. So if we give it a moment for Carrie to check, that would be okay. I don't have any. You see, since we've gone to Zoom, they're neglecting us, the public is. But such is our fate. In that case, I will close the public hearing. What would the board like to do on this matter? Or we should uh, deal with the waiver before we do anything else. Is there any motion regarding a waiver? The waiver for the uh, 70 feet thing? Yes. I would uh, make the motion that we grant the waiver uh, dependent upon uh, agreement being made with the uh, with um, Mike and the fire department. So that's a motion. Yes. Is there a second? Yeah, it's going to die right there. I, I like that. Then the well, for discussion purposes. Are you seconding it then, John? Yes. Okay. I, I guess I've got another question to Jim on on that waiver. Can the buildings like 9, 10, 11, 12 be moved a little further to the north, which would then allow you to move the road further to the north, thereby extending that uh, turnaround that you might get closer to the 70 feet? Do you understand what I'm trying to get at, Jim? Yeah, uh, my recollection, John, was, I mean, we're pretty close to the, to the setback line up there. Uh, and I don't know that it would get us out to the distance, even if I put it right on the setback. And then I've got to get utilities out the back of that building to accommodate the septic and wastewater disposal. So everything starts kind of binding up on that side over that way. Hey, Dwight, can you chime in on, I mean, what would be the, the setback to that property line? Oh, let me check real quick. Whoa, whoa. Should be right on the plan, Dwight. In the rural zone, we're looking at 15 feet on the sideline and 15 feet on the rear. And you got septic tanks back there. I mean, it's probably maybe 40 feet from the back edge of the building to the property line. I mean, that's just a rough guess on my part. Uh, well, that, gonna, I, the, road, the road is 20 feet wide, so if you use that as a reference, you can you can see how uh, little room we have on that. I, mean, I would like to see it massaged a little, because we're, we're trying to gain that T to 70 feet. Is that correct, Mike Hangy? I believe that's what the ordinance says. Yes. I mean, I'd, I'd like to see the, is it 50 feet to the center of the road or? The, the ordinance actually says 70 feet from the center of the road, center line of the road to the end of the turnaround. Okay, so according to the site plan, that turnaround is 50 feet to the center of the road, is that correct? Correct, but he's, but Jim has actually said that he is gonna actually increase it to six, he can increase it to 60. So we're within 10 feet. Okay. I mean, if we can try and get it as close as possible to 70 uh, without creating any great hardship, uh, I mean, I'd like to see it as close as we can get to what the ordinance calls for. I guess I would leave it to Jim to work his magic. Then we'll do the way tonight anyway. Any further discussion on the motion to grant the waiver? OK. 
Okay. In that case, all in favor of granting the waiver, please. Aye. Opposed? That's two. Opposed? One, two, three opposed. Four opposed. The motion has failed. So the waiver is not granted. Now, we are here on a preliminary to um, make a determination of completeness. Has anyone found anything in the application which they feel is not, does not render it complete? Okay. Just uh, one question on um, whether it's complete or not. I, I, I noticed in, the, in our paperwork that we didn't have the <clears throat> checklist. I was just wondering if that was something that I asked Carrie and there wasn't one available for this. Are, are we going to still continue using that, that checklist that we have been using in the past couple of months? Because I, I thought that was very beneficial. Maybe staff can pipe in. They were in the others. But there, was, there wasn't I a. The I believe the checklist was in the package. I have it in my submittal criteria. Oh, wait a second. That's a fire department. No, I'm sorry. We did not put it in there. John. We can certainly put that in, John. And, well, that, this, is, this is something that the staff does. Wow. John, we, this is John. Same, this is John, Teresa. I thought it was my fault. This is Teresa, and yes, we can include that checklist um, in the future. And in the TRT report, under general, there are some items that when you look at the checkoff list, we couldn't check them off the list. The base plan, for instance, and the direction of existing surface water drainage. Those couple of things we don't have, I mean, the surface water drainage arrows, I, you know, we don't generally include them anymore because the topo pretty much tells you where the water is going. Uh, and that's what I explained in a uh, letter uh, addressed to after the TRT meeting. Uh, if it's really desired by the board, uh, we can include them, but it just adds more uh, information to the plan and starts getting uh, some plans that are already uh, quite busy, uh, even more busy with directional arrows. Um, but we can put them in for final if, if the board so desires. Well, since it's required by the ordinance, I think that would be appropriate. Yep. And those other comments, we will uh, show the entire parcel on the, uh, on the plan. It will be an insert plan, a smaller scale, um, but we'll show the entire parcel to show that additional information. So is there a motion regarding completeness, please? I'll make a motion that the preliminary plan for major site use development and major subdivision titled Kelly Estates for Stephen Grass is complete. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? In that case, all in favor, please raise a hand. Rick, are you? Did, okay, thank you. Yes, I did. Oh, I didn't uh, notice. So let me let me just ask the question procedurally. Uh, given that the the uh, that the waiver was not granted, uh, how how do we resolve that going forward? Do you just have to do it, or that's up to the applicant? Yes. As it stands now, the, with the waiver not granted, he does have to comply with the ordinance. Okay, that concludes item four. Item five is a final plan review for a re revision to a previously approved major subdivision 
entitled Beachland Terraces 2A for Associated Builders. The proposal is to divide lot five, tax map 15, lot 33-2, in a 1.8 acre uh, parcel into two parcels creating lot 5A of 0.92 acres and lot 5B of 0.92 acres to create a total of 13 lots in the subdivision located on the Beachland Road. All the subject property is located in the neighbor, neighborhood zone. Is someone representing the applicant, please? Stephen Salisbury. Okay, go ahead, please. Thank you, John. Uh, Allison King is also representing the um, developer. So from our last meeting, I revised the plan to show a different lot configuration. We got rid of the septic easement and we confirm the site distances, which I'm not sure why the TRT report still commented that we didn't demonstrate that. Um, in our July 20 resubmission, we, we addressed the site distances and you should have that information with that resubmission. You want me to jump in? Sure. Uh, I think the question, Steve, was somewhere in past planning um, approvals on on that lot. It was uh, there's a note in the plan on the plans that that show um, that require no site no access um, on the property, and that that's the primary issue, not necessarily the demonstration of the site distance. Oh, okay. Question, further questions from the board? Uh, just could we, or could I get a uh, explanation or clarification on the access via Grandview Road? Um, on the TRT report, this is the, the yes. second sub bullet. Um, can, can you elaborate on that, Steve? <laughs> I'll let Allison elaborate on that. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. This is my first Zoom planning board meeting, so bear with me. Um, typically, when there's a note on a plan, there is uh, some expectation that the other lot owners might have some interest in enforcing such a note. Um, I did discuss this with Ed Bearer, and I believe he sent an email to the planning department about this, stating that while it might be best for the developer to get the consent of the other lot owners, it isn't necessarily within the purview of the board to require that. But I think that's what the initial concern was. That was the initial concern. According to the quotation in the um, TRT, if both the planning board minutes and the plan make it clear that lot five can only have access via Grandview, then in my opinion, the other lot owner, owners need to assent to the change. And the question is, have they done so? And I think that report was before the opinion from Ed Bearer. No, that is, it says the city attorney offered the following, and then I quoted that. that. So when, when we were preparing the TRT report, we had an initial comment and feedback from the city's attorney about what his opinion on whether or not the lot owners needed to assent to the change or not. And I think um, since then, Allison and Ed have had some conversations and that may have um, changed Ed's, Ed's opinion. And Teresa may be able to weigh in I haven't talked to him directly, but um, I believe we did get some emails to that were um, similar to what Allison just said about it's really up to the lot owners to, to figure that part out. I, I concur with Noel. Okay, so I think then, then I think, any complications around the developer? I think that's what the conclusion was from the attorneys, yes. Okay. 
for, for that issue. That, yeah, as you said, not something the planning board is legitimately concerned with. So now, what about the site distance? We've measured the site distance both on Grandview and um, Beachland Road and uh, meet the minimum site distances on both roads. Okay. And what about the um, lot size for 5A? That um, goes to the same comment about the note on the plan about the um, entrance onto Grandview only. That would be between the lot owners. This meets the minimum zoning for the city of Ellsworth at this point in time. Okay. And I, I just want to clarify, Steve. Um, so when we picked it up, it was um, part of the deed covenants. And I, I think the deed covenants that were included in the application materials are, I don't know, I, I think I recall you saying something about them being um, template deed covenants or, or something like that, but it's not. So the note in the plan um, for the site distance or for the access was actually in the plan and as part of planning board minutes as part of the approval, but the 40,000 square feet is actually in the deed covenants that were are associated with that. So is that really the same issue or is that a separate, is that a separate thing altogether? I, I, if I may, I think it's the same issue. I didn't find a blanket deed covenant document covering this actual lot. So again, I think it would be up to the other lot owners if it's something that they decide to enforce or try to enforce, but this actual deed, this lot doesn't have that covenant attached to it and it's not on the plan that I saw. I yeah. didn't see any restrictions recorded. Yeah, I think that's what we just wanted clarification on is that it wasn't clear what those covenants covered and whether or not it was applicable to this particular lot or the whole subdivision. Sure. Any further Second. comments? Excuse me. Any further comments or questions from the planning board? Uh, I just want to comment that there—it just feels like there's some similarities between this and an uh, uh, agenda item. I've set my notes aside um, from the last planning board, where I think there was a conversation that came up about uh, what is the responsibility of the planning board and/or the code enforcement officer to enforce, like homeowner association rules after the fact. And I think Rick had a lot to say in this and my recollection is uh, not much that really, I think that our conversation last time was that's, that's the business of that neighborhood or HOA. Um, and it's, it's not so much the CEO or the, or the planning board. So it just feels to me like this is a lot of similar. I don't know if the other members feel the same or if they're yeah. seeing what I'm seeing. Jim and Fink, this Dwight. I think staff's concern was it would be a shame to have someone buy this lot, start a foundation and have the members of the subdivision, hire an attorney to say you can't do this. Uh, and that's, that's the only comment I have in regard to it. I don't, either way, it doesn't really concern me personally, but I think, I think if staff was legitimate to bring this question before the board. Right, and, and I, I, I agree. I think that would be an unfortunate circumstance, uh, but I wonder at the obligation and the responsibility of the planning board in, in this regard. As unfortunate as that might be, is it our job to protect those other homeowners? My understanding is that it would be nice if we could, but um, under state law, we really can't. Mm -hmm. um, the city has no interest, unless it were granted by the um, deed restrictions, to uh, do anything about it. Yeah, I it think last that. time we came up with, I mean, there, were, there can be all kinds of deed restrictions. Um, not just, you know, this one. Uh, and I think the, the, the resolution really was that it's not the planning board's purview, even though we might like it to be or might have something uh, useful to say. It's just kind of like a, a moot point in that sense. And I hate to be mooted or muted. You can always mute it. yourself. <laughs> uh, anyone else? John? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Someone referenced an opinion from Ed Bear. Uh, did we get a copy of that or just exactly what was his opinion? We actually um, just put it, his, his um, quote in the TRT report, that was the initial opinion. And then since then, he, uh, I believe he's been communicating with Teresa. Um, I don't think you have a copy of that, but it's, it's essentially the same thing 
as what Allison said, which that, is that, really up to the planning board. To... That, that's the only issue I, I really have with this is that um, setting the prior conversation aside about where the planning board and CEO's authority ends, the only data we have from the lawyer in writing is what we have in writing. So it's kind of unfortunate that we didn't receive any evidence of these subsequent communications where he seems to have reversed his position, right? That that would be helpful at this moment and probably would get us to the finish line here. But Teresa, do you have a comment on this? Yes. Um, so this is an email dated July 30th from Ed. Uh, he says, I've been speaking with attorney King about the matter we discussed last week. I want to clarify my comments to the extent that I imply that the developer or individual seeking to remove a condition from the approved subdivision plan needs consent from other lot owners. While that may be the case, I don't mean to suggest that the city needs evidence of those consents to entertain the application to amend the subdivision. Okay, that's certainly my understanding of the matter. Anyone else? John? Well, uh, yeah, I'll still question um, on the TRT notes uh, dated July 22nd under the clarification on plan notes. Says lot five shall be accessed by Grandview Road only. I mean, if that was on the original approval, I mean, wasn't that? Would that have been a condition of approval put on by the planning board? And if that's the case, and we seem to be taking a, a cavalier attitude that, okay, well, it's up to the lot owners to, to figure this out. It's, it's not up to the planning board to figure it out. I, I kind of wonder, are we not, is it a violation of the original plan? Well, if that, if, <laughs> With that access on the approved plan, that that is that is what it must be. John, may I speak? Sure. Um, Ed also on July twenty first um, commented again. If both the planning board minutes and the plan make it clear that Lot Five can only have access via Grand View then in my opinion, the other lot owners need to assent to the change. And we did some research on past plans and it's and minutes and they specifically say lot five can only have access via Grand View. It's on the signed subdivision plans and it's in the minutes. So as far as the city is concerned, that is it. Um, we can't, we've not been asked to change that now and we haven't done that. Now, back to, I believe there, Dwight? Yes. Please? Yes. Go ahead, please. No, I, I wasn't going to talk. Oh. All right. <laughs> I accept that. Anyone else wish to say something? Now, unfortunately, I've gotten a little confused. Have we approved, the, did we pass the motion that this is a complete plan? Oh. Help me out here. No. Okay, in that case, it has been moved and seconded all in favor of this being a complete plan of, with the exception of a couple of details that will be taken care of in the final. All in favor, mm -hmm. please. Well, this is for a final review, John. Oh, so, oh, I'm, okay, thank you. I'm, I'm in the past here. Yeah, all right. Different application. So what does the board wish to do? I need to ask a question real quick. Right? Sure. I'm, I'm getting confused as well. I don't know if it's age or maybe our hairstyle. Um, <laughs> but 
But uh, no, it, no, it's anticipating going and being a teacher to your grandchildren. <laughs> I'm already there, buddy. <laughs> um, the uh, so if if the planning board in the past, because I, I read through all those notes and there's a there's a long history to this thing. Um, if the planning board approved that the access can only be by grant uh, via grand view, then I can't see how we can change that until an ordinance is changed. All right. So to me, it's like a, a dead issue. It's it is what it is. It certainly is at this point. Yes. Okay. So right. basically, but in order for it to be okay with us, if we got something that said that, you know, the, the proof of assent by the other property owners would be good to go though. Is that correct? Well, it's based on, based on what the legal opinion was. But I, again, I, I don't think that it's a planning board matter. It may be for the applicant but it's not in violation of any ordinance that we're involved with. Then, then how did we get involved in it in the first place? Good question. Yeah, I, I'm actually wondering how it came up. It, does it say in the plan somewhere that the applicant intends to access the new lot uh, via Beachland? Is, is, is that in there? It does seem to me, that I, I agree with John, that it's sort of, that's, that's their issue, that this is the new lot. You can get to it via Grandview Road. And if you don't want to do that, you can talk to the neighbors. Uh, it seems to be what I'm seeing here. I, I think Steve can probably weigh in on the access, but I think the lot division shows that there's a potential access on Grandview and a potential access on that there's frontage on both roads. Okay, so, so this is just road. clarifying. Though you see frontage, you are not really clear to use it based on the covenant nope. as it stands. Uh, Dwight and Teresa can weigh in on this as well, but I think the, the issue is we identified through our review that the D, that uh, in past planning board approvals for this project, there was a, a note and a, and a planning board requirement on the plan that you couldn't access this lot from Grandview or Beachland, I, whichever Beach. one we're talking about, Beach. Beachland. And so so we pointed that out. So the applicant had the opportunity to, to clarify to the board what ability the board itself has to waive or modify that past requirement. So so they're, they're coming in to the planning board for a modification for subdivision standards. So that gives you the ability to, to revisit that. So Steve, mm. we asked Steve at some point to um, record to show site distances to provide some additional information which you can uh, weigh. Our the city's attorney has said the lots uh, the lot owners in that past subdivision need to assent to that change, and has also said in more recent conversations and Allison can can weigh in on this as well that um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the planning board has to require that. It doesn't mean you, you it doesn't mean you can't require that, but it doesn't mean you have to require that, I think is what, what I got from that. I, I guess I guess what I was getting at is that I, I'm not putting two things together here, that approving this subdivision change, I'm not seeing how that equates to, unless it's in the plan explicitly and I've missed it, how approving the subdivision change equates to and the owner can now utilize access via Beachland, which was previously. I, I'm not seeing how the two things are, are, are equating to one another. I, I, it seems like the planning board is just being asked to approve the uh, the the new geometry of the of the subdivision, and I'm I'm just not clear on why the access issue is really even in front of us. If I may, I took the note off the plan, so there's no discussion about accessing. Um, Grandview Road and fully intend, you know, would access Lot 5A via Beachland Road and provided the demonstration of site visibility on Beachland Road for that explicit purpose. And if I may, um, Mr. Chairman. Yes, um, go ahead. 
I just had an informal discussion with the applicant who told me that when this was approved originally, there was a different configuration of drainage on Beachland Road. And since that road was substantially changed within the past few years, um, I guess at the time of the original limitation on the plan, there was some concern about the actual um, the road construction that has completely changed at this point. So I think that might be um, a consideration for the board when thinking about what past boards have done versus what you're looking at under the current ordinance and the current conditions. So I'm looking at all these tiles. Does anyone wish to respond to that? Well, no, I, would, I would go back to what, what Nelson just said, uh, I think. Uh, and that, I mean, what the planning board is really being asked to do here is look at old lot five and divide it into two pieces. And that's what we can do or, or not do. So we either prove that or not approve that. But it's not clear to me, even though we might want to go further, um, that we, you know, it, it, that's it, right? That's the end of what we can do or not do. Uh, well, that's all we're, that's all we're asked to do. Like attaching conditions to that, which are, really beyond our purview is seems inappropriate. I think the gist of it based on the the approval of the subdivision is that lot five was to be accessed through Grandview. The splitting of the lot doesn't really change that. The access is still from there. We've not been asked to change the access. And so there's not, you know, there's nothing, all we're asked to do is approve the splitting of the lot. Right. Okay. It, may, it may create an issue for someone because 5A by some definition becomes inaccessible, but that that is not mm -hmm. what's in front of us. Yeah. Right? That's not, not the ask. On, on yes, it may be unfortunate, but, but uh, Nelson is, tr is is right. Does the applicant wish to proceed at this point? Yes. Okay. In that case, is there a motion regarding the final approval? I think you already did that, didn't we? No, we we have not done this one yet. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the final plan review for major subdivision entitled Beachland Terraces 2A for Associated Builders, Inc. The proposal to amend the previously approved subdivision Beachland Terraces 2A to divide lot five, a 1.84 acre lot tax map 15 lot 33-2 into two separate parcels, lot 5B, 1.22 acres and lot 5A, 0.62 acres, bringing the lot count of Beachland Terraces 2A to 13 subdivision Lots. Second. Is there a second, please? Second. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please. Motion carries. Okay. Steve, does this mean you're leaving us? Oh, no. Unfortunately, for you, no. Well, but it's like a member. Is your clock ticking? Are you being paid for this? Of course. Okay, so it's not it's it's not unfortunate for us. It's not unfortunate for you. And the next item of business is a preliminary plan for revision to a previously approved major subdivision entitled Tinker Hill Subdivision for Lisa Whitmore. The proposal is to adjust the property line between Lot Seven, Tax Map Twenty One, Lot Three Dash Seven and lot 11, tax map 21, lot 3-11 of the subdivision located off the Bayside Road in the rural and limited residential zones. And before asking someone representing the applicant, because I am, uh, am acquainted with, the app, with, the, with Lisa Whitmore, I am going to recuse myself from this discussion. So is someone representing the applicant and John, DeLeo, would you please chair this part of the meeting? Okay. Take it away, Steve. Steve Salisbury for the applicant. And uh, if I could correct what John said, I think this is the final reading for this application. 
No. No. This is a preliminary plan review. It, it says preliminary in all the paper we have. Our agenda states preliminary. Right. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we've uh, asked to adjust the lot line uh, between lot seven and 11 to accommodate um, a, a driveway that is on lot seven. Steve, look, look at the map here for lot seven on the, on the left side. There's that kind of odd looking little bump out. Is, is that the adjustment? That's yes. Okay. I think this is a pretty straightforward. The it only affect the the change of the lot line only affects those two lots. Both the uh, owners are in agreement with it. Uh, there's nothing really else to consider. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Steve? If not, then I'll open the public hearing. Uh, wait a couple of minutes to see if anybody wants to chime into this. So who's who's taking emails or whatever? Was that uh, Carrie doing that or Dwight or? Uh, Carrie is. Carrie. Yep. Um, I I don't have anything from the public on this particular application, but um, I don't recall the public hearing being open for the Beachland Terrace agenda item. I think we may need to go back and do that. Um, I don't, I don't recall that happening. I think that is it's true. Correct. I was very neglectful. You're right. <laughs> okay. Well, 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 we'll work on number six for now. Uh, considering nobody has is, is entered any comments, uh, I'll close the public hearing and ask for a motion. Uh, the only comment before we go there is just one, the, the one note on the TRT report, property served by City Water, removed drinking well shown on plans. Um, just sounds like some paperwork for Steve to take care of. I presume you saw that note on the TRT report. Yes. The only note. Yeah. Yeah, we provided a narrative and we made that change. Okay. That's it. Somebody like to make a motion. I move that the preliminary plan review for revision to a previously approved major subdivision plan entitled Tinkerel Hill Subdivision for Lisa Whitmore be approved. Or I guess that it's- well, We're not approving it, we're just that the plan is complete. Yeah, I'm sorry, you, plan is complete. I meant to say that. Okay, is there a second? Second. All in favor, raise your hand, please. I can't see everybody, so is John Fink doing the counting? Is it 4 out? Nelson's a yes. Oh, looks like it's 4 out. And I'll let John take it back to number five. Yes. Um, does anyone wish to comment on the um, item five, the re revision to the Beachland Terraces two-way? Do we have anyone who wishes to comment, Terry? No, I haven't received any emails from the public. Thanks. Okay. Well, public hearing is closed belatedly. Open and closed. And we now get hmm? item seven is final plan review for a major subdivision entitled Subdivision of Ellsworth Shopping Center for DK Ellsworth Shopping Center, LLC. The proposal is to subdivide and reconfigure approximately 22 and a half acres of land currently or previously owned by DK Ellsworth Shopping Center, LLC. Tax map 131, lots 13, 14, 17, and 25 into four lots consisting of 
4.67 acres, the current site of Oriel Way townhouses, 10.96 acres, the current site of the Elsa Shopping Center, 2.73 acres, the proposed site of the Foster Street Apartments Phase 1, and 3 acres, the proposed site of the Foster Street Apartments Phase 2. The land is located in the urban and downtown zones. Is someone representing the applicant, please? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Nancy St. Clair. I'm here. Can you all hear me? Yes. Excellent. Well, uh, so as you may can you hear me? Uh, it's a little intermittent. Okay. Uh, as you may recall, we were before the planning board on July 1st, at which time the subdivision was accepted as complete. Uh, we're here tonight to think, seek final approval for uh, this subdivision on behalf of DK Ellsworth Shopping Center, LLC. As you may recall from our prior discussions, the need for this subdivision is with regard to the fact that uh, a few years ago, the lot was carved off for the Oriel Way Apartments. Uh, it was cut out from the shopping center parcel. The proposed conveyance of the two lots to D.K. Ellsworth, uh, UK pre <laughs> DC Pre-Development LLC uh, for Foster Street Apartments. We now are in a situation where we have four lots created within a five-year period. Uh, so we are asking for subdivision approval to create lots on uh, a portion of the Ellsworth Shopping Center site. There's no physical improvements that are proposed. It is simply to create the lots to allow uh, conveyance uh, for the project. It's the next item on your agenda. Comments, questions from the planning board? Uh, one question, Nancy. The the three acres that you need for the proposed site of the Foster Street Apartments Phase Two, I mean, that hasn't changed as a result of the the change in the market rate apartments going from one building, I mean, from two to one. It's still going to be the the same lot. That is correct. There was no change to the lot line for Phase Two. Just simply the development within that lot. Thank you. Yeah, if I could summarize this. Uh, and if simply... I might point out, Mr. Ch yes, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, if I might point out, the property area on the face of the subdivision plat is the property area summary, which identifies all of the individual lots that are proposed as part of this subdivision uh, and all the properties that originally went into uh, the uh, Deeds for the shopping center when it was acquired by DK Ellsworth Shopping Center LLC. Yes, I was saying this is really a rather simple uh, matter because it's just confirming by approving subdivision for the lot lines that are existing at this point. There's nothing requiring us to look at wait, uh, a drainage or anything else. It's just a matter of establishing the lot lines as legal. Is there, for, are there further questions or discussion? In that case, let me open this to public hearing. Is there anyone who wishes to comment upon this matter? Carrie? No, I don't have anything uh, for that, John. And no one's beating on the door downstairs to uh, speak, huh? No. All right. In that case, what would the board like to do? Again, one, one more comment from the TRT. Applicant should revise plans accordingly to add notes regarding to proposed easements right away. Uh, Nancy, have you seen that note and is it addressed in the current version? 
Uh, yes, to our to our understanding, it is. We have highlighted the easement area not only for uh, the existing Oriel Way, but also for the storm drain lines, which are referenced in the uh, purchase and sale agreement to DC Pre-Development LLC. Those are the storm drain lines from the shopping center that cross over uh, the lot three. Uh, in addition, we've also shown on the plan the proposed easement, which would benefit lot three that crosses over lot four, and that is for the drainage from phase one in Foster Street Apartments to cross over phase two of Foster Street Apartments and connect into the drainage system in Foster Street. Thank you. Is there a motion regarding this matter? I'll make a motion to approve the final plan review for major subdivision entitled Subdivision of Ellsworth Shopping Center for DK Ellsworth Shopping Center LLC. Uh, do you want me to read the rest of it, John? I don't. It can just be included as part of the motion, I think. And the rest of the item agenda is included in the motion. Yes. Uh, is there a second? Second. Okay, thank you. Any, any further discussion? In that case, all in favor, please. The motion has carried. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. The next item of business is something tabled from the previous meeting, the final plan review for a major use site development plan and major subdivision entitled Foster Street Apartments for DC Pre-Development LLC. The proposal is to construct 41 apartment units, one market rate 12 unit building, and one senior housing 29 unit 29 unit building on 6.16 acre parcel, tax map 131, lots 13, 14, and part of lot 17 in the vicinity of Foster Street and Oriel Way, located in the urban and downtown zones. Is someone representing the applicant, please? Mr. Chairman, my name is Nancy St. Clair. I'm here tonight on behalf of DC Pre-Development LLC. Kevin Bunker is also here tonight representing the applicant as well. So give us a little uh, summary of where we are at this point. So uh, we'll be brief with regard to this. Uh, as you folks recall from our last meeting with you on July 1st, uh, we talked about the two phases of the project uh, and the application, as you noted, was tabled uh, at that time. One of the items that was discussed really focused in on phase two. Uh, we've really made no changes to phase one, uh, and there wasn't a tremendous amount of discussion with the board uh, on phase one. So phase one remains at 29 uh, senior affordable one-bedroom units in one building. Uh, that's located off Oriole Way, and it's on lot three, as shown on the subdivision plan that you folks just approved. Phase two of Foster Street Apartments is where we've made some changes since the last time we met with you. There are a few items that were discussed with regard to phase two, one of which was site distance and the need to do some additional clearing potentially off the site uh, along Foster Street. In addition, if you recall, we had mentioned that there were some geotechnical comments received uh, from our geotechnical engineer and a question with regard to the retaining walls that were provided on the site, uh, as well as the fire department had concern about access to the second building that was shown in phase two, located northerly on the northern end of the site. So if you uh, take a look at the plans that you have seen, you'll see that we've made uh, quite a bit of a change in that we've eliminated one of the 12 unit buildings. We previously had proposed 24 uh, apartments in two 12 unit buildings. We're now one 12 unit building on the site. The building has shifted just a little bit uh, to the north and to the west. That gives us a little bit more separation between the easterly property limit and the 
uh, back of the sidewalk along Foster Street. One of the items that was discussed uh, early on in the planning board review process was the, uh, re the request that we have only one curb cut on Foster Street. That still remains uh, with the plan, but we've been able to relocate that curb cut about 100 feet to the west. By doing that, we've addressed the site distance uh, requirements such, there's no, such that there's no longer a need to do any clearing along Foster Street. We've provided as part of your application materials an updated letter uh, from our traffic engineer uh, regarding the new location of the proposed driveway and that it meets and exceeds the municipal site distance requirements at its new location. With the reduction in the number of units, we've also reduced the number of parking spaces on the site. Uh, we had a proposed 36 and we're down to um, 20 on our site now. So we have an overall reduction in the amount of development on the site with regard to the number of units, the number of parking spaces, the impervious area, et cetera. With this change, we've also eliminated, we've had an area that was Course pavement. We've uh, been able to eliminate that and instead treat the runoff from the impervious area with a grass under drain soil filter, which is located in what would be the uh, southwest corner of the site. And we have three bioretention cells that are scattered around the corners of the proposed building. Uh, so, with that, I'll turn it up to you folks for any questions you may have. So, are there questions? Oh, come on. I do have a comment. Okay. Uh, Nancy, this, this, this uh, layout looks a whole lot better than they originally did. I like how this has changed and uh, modified and it doesn't look so cramped. So nice work there. Thank you. Anyone else? I concur with that. It, it it just felt like a lot of building in, in, a, in a small space previously. But I also want to confirm that this is, uh, the intention right now is this is it, phase two. There's no, we're going to add that second 12 unit building at another time as part of phase three or 2B. This is, this is uh, sort of the permanent plan at this point. There's no phase 2A proposed. And if there were in the future, they'd be right back to us. So. And that the, is correct. And <laughs> the risk of rehashing all of this, lots of drainage conversations. Uh, that was kind of almost, I think, where we started this, this journey. Um, so with the changes in phase two and all the um, water treatment plans, this is still um, to drain into the city system that runs down Foster Street uh, that we had discussed, I think, at least at two or three different meetings. So that plan remains the same, that the, that the rainwater is collected, emptied into the city system, drains down Foster Street, and the uh, engineering is such that we should not expect significant runoff downhill as, as distressed the downhill neighbors as a result of previous projects. That's correct. Let me open the public hearing. This is a public hearing. Does anyone wish to comment? Oh, John, I had a question. I was, I muted myself. Oh. Uh, kind of like Nelson's line of question and to city staff, does the elimination of the one 12 unit apartment building have any effect on, I remember correctly, the developer was going to enlarge the stormwater uh, system on Foster Street down to water, if I'm correct, Dwight, can you refresh my memory on that? Yes, to my knowledge, uh, they're not gonna reduce what they originally submitted to us, although they did reduce the total impervious, uh, it's not gonna make enough difference to, be, to not, uh, and why expand the stormwater system for the city. And Nancy can correct me if I'm wrong. That's correct. We are still proposing a new 15-inch line down Foster Street to connect into the existing system in Foster Street. 
Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, the only other comment I would make is just because we received an email from Purple Ribbon, an anonymous tenant of Oreo Way, I'm, has everybody seen that email? Nancy, have you seen that email? Yes. No. Is that a no, Nancy? No. Okay. Uh, just, I mean, or maybe Mr. Is Mr. Bunker with us? Kevin, can uh, have yeah. you seen that? You know, I mean, it, no, no, it's the first I've heard of it. Questions, the questions he asked are, I mean, out of our hands. I mean, uh, but I just wanted to bring it up that it was a, a you know, brought to the attention of the planning board and. If, if you want to make a comment, feel free. Okay, uh, I I haven't seen it, so I have no idea what it says. So, John, do you have a copy there you could read? Yes, it says, uh, "Mr. Bunker's continuous efforts to demonstrate how he is not making money should be raising some concern for the board members." I would ask Mr. Bunker how he plans to make money. After all, BC and his investment company, I'd really like to hear more questions and discussion regarding the contracts. Please be mindful of any stipulation or language. The contract, contact, I think it means contract, may grant Mr. Bunker the right to sell or convert the apartments after a certain number of years, anonymous tenant of Oriel Way. If I could comment before Kevin does, these are not matters that the planning board has any say over. Uh, we are dealing with matter of land use, not whether someone is going to going to make money or lose money it has nothing, unfortunately or fortunately, to do with us. Kevin, do you wish to say anything? Though you need not. Um, well, you know, I, I can at least allay the fear that there, you know, for this gentleman, if or gentlewoman person, if they're watching, um, that there's any ability to ever convert affordable housing to uh, market rate and sell them. They um, the way the affordable housing program used to work was as a 15 year restriction and then, then the restriction would burn off. And what happened about 15 years after the program started, which was in 1986, was all these projects, the use restrictions expired and all these developers took the buildings and they would kick all the affordable housing people out and bring in market rate people. And that, that caused some reforms at the federal and state levels. And by the time I came into the business in 2007, that had all been fixed and there are now these uh, uh, land use, there's a, a bunch of interlocking provisions in these agreements, in the land use agreements with uh, Maine State Housing that effectively prevent that from ever happening. Uh, not only that, but your own TIF in the city prevents that from happening for 30 years. Uh, but the, the main housing use restrictions go beyond that, they go for a period of 45 years. And then even, and that, that by the way is, oh, 18 years longer than the depreciable basis of the building. So in other words, the building will not be without new investment, it won't be worth much in 45 years. And on top of that, all the financing that comes from Maine State Housing Authority, the tax credits don't have to be repaid, but all the subsidy that comes from Maine Housing is soft debt. So it's not, not grant money, it's money that would have to be repaid if the use restrictions were ever to burn off. So. All that's a complex way of saying that once we do an affordable housing project in the state of Maine, anywhere else in the country, that's all it's ever gonna be. It's locked up tight. The, the, the people that created the affordable housing program restrictions that are in place today have, uh, have anticipated um, sleazy developers coming in and cashing in and prevented it a long time ago. It's not the first time anyone's thought of that and it's, it was dealt with decades ago. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, now, this is a public hearing. Does anyone in the great out there wish to comment? Kerry, do you have anyone? I do not, John. You really need to do a better job of getting these people to talk. Oh, well. Okay, does... Are there any uh, further comments from the board? And if not, what does the board wish to do?
The board doesn't wish to do anything, huh? We prevent us from staying the rest of our natural lives in this particular meeting. Uh, I would uh, make the motion that the uh, final plan review for a major use site development plan and major subdivision entitled Foster Streets apartment be approved. Because we never had anything go to court. Is there a second? Second. Yeah, but there's okay. Any discussion? I know what you're saying. Uh, I would, uh, unless this has already occurred, just a small amendment to the uh, mm -hmm. to the motion that right. the DP stormwater PBR approval uh, is received okay. uh, as a condition of the approval here. Yeah. Fine with me. It has been received, just so you all know. Yeah, I saw that. Thank been. you. Okay. Received. All in favor then? And to court before it's scary when there's a casual okay case. we have concluded the business portion of the meeting and yep. be just before we adjourn i would like to thank say you. thank you to molly and patrick for putting up with watching us i hope that very soon you'll be um victims with the rest of us having to deal with this stuff and dave I'm, as I said, I think I had an email. I'm sorry that you're going, but um, as I also said, I'm very impressed that your children want you to teach their children and your grandchildren. So I wish you the best in this. Thank you. I appreciate the short period of time to, to serve the city. So uh, thanks a lot. Well, if you come back, you might get roped into something, you know. I'm sure. The next item of business is adjournment. Is there a motion to adjourn, please? So moved. Second. 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 Okay. All in favor of adjournment, please. All right. Thank you. We stand adjourned. Happy trails, kids. Oh, better one. I'll just leave it here.